So I'm gonna tell you the story of the white tipped common. So I probably have to cast my mind back to nearly four years ago, it was 2020. I just finished uh, fishing the rise and I'd caught the big one out of there and I was like anything, you think, where do I go next? And um, I happened to see a picture of Adam Penning holding this long, dark common, really beautiful fish in a local club lake. And uh, you wouldn't believe this, this fish lived in a club lake, but um, I happened to have the ticket. I weren't really sure on the stock of the lake. All I knew is that this common lived in there. And uh, the first time I went to the lake, I walked down the path and it's about a, probably half a mile long and the fields were surrounded in blue flowers, super picturesque. And I walked down to this beautiful, I reckon it's around seven or eight acres lake, thick weed all across the surface of it. And in amongst the weed, I see a couple of fish and right away I thought I found them. I've run back up to the van, got a bit of gear, come down and within about half an hour, it becomes super clear that although this lake contained this big, long, dark common, it also contained a lot of other carp. So um, I ended up setting, round, setting up in a swim called the Woods Bank. And I did the night in there. That night, I caught my first carp, um, a very beautiful, dark black common of 25 pounds, typical of this venue. It's absolutely full of commons. There's probably somewhere in the region of 150 to 200 fish. Some people will say a lot more, but I reckon around that. And um, a lot of them at this time were 20 pound commons. So yeah, I fished the night. I ended up having another one of 28 pound. Again, an absolutely beautiful dark black common. Over the next few months, um, I've done really well. Caught a lot of carp, really regular and went through a hell of a lot of bait. <laughs> but I never felt any closer to the long common, this big white tipped common. Uh, the biggest fish I caught in my first 40 odd fish was about 27 pound. And it was really hard for me to get through into the bigger fish. So um, I tried a few different tactics. I changed from fishing over loads of bait with a wafter to fishing over a lot of bait and a, a hinge stiff, which is a renowned big fish rig. So I started fishing these two inch hinge stiffs and um, I managed to catch my first 30. My first 30 was a 33 pound common. And um, I was chuffed. I think it was like my 49th or my 50th fish. And over the course of the next few weeks, I'm only doing one to two nights a week on there. I managed to catch another couple of 30s fishing hinge stiffs. Um, at that point, I experienced my only hook pull of my entire campaign. I lost a fish that obviously felt good. Definitely not the big one, but A30. Yeah, and um, what happened? We came into that winter and I think COVID struck. So this was the year that you couldn't fish nights. So I was basically going down there during the days in the winter and it was a harsh winter. We had um, a lot of snow. The lake iced over twice and I was only doing the days I managed to catch a few fish, nothing massive, um, up to big 20s, but all the time feeling like I was a little bit closer to the big one. Now in this time, the big one's been caught quite a few times. Uh, from either end of the lake, there was no real pattern to it. Sometimes guys would catch it as their first fish, um, guys would catch it as their hundredth fish, and uh, yeah, there was sort of no pattern to it. So all I could do was continuously catch fish and try to build a picture of where this carp would come from and try and predict its pattern to which most of the time I was there, it had absolutely none. When the first year come to an end, I'd probably caught around seven or eight 30s, uh, the biggest being a 37 pound common, absolutely beautiful. But in amongst them, some commons that just make your jaw drop. I mean, absolutely beautiful 34, 35 pound commons that were jet black. The water on this lake is gin clear. The first year I was on there, it was very weedy. So that just lent itself to the fish being very dark in color. So the next year's coming round and um, I started to fish it a little bit among other waters, because it ain't the only fish I'm targeting. It's just a carp I want to catch and uh, my Frimley ticket came up. 
So I ended up joining Frimley, and with places like Frimley, the carp are so old, you can't really afford to say, oh, I'm gonna keep the ticket for a few years because some of them fish are 50 years old. They might not be here next year. So I went on to Frimley and I didn't really return to where White Tips lived for most of the year. I think I'd done one or two nights. The next year I decided to give it a bit more of a go and um, I'd come up with this plan that the big one lived in the edge. And, and what was happening, I was getting down there and catching fish from the lake was never a problem. If I got on the main shoals of fish, they'd be showing or fizzing like normal, all the normal signs you look for a carp or getting on the wind, I would catch fish. But I figured out that a lot of the bigger fish didn't come out with the groups they spent most of their summer in the margins. So what I'd do is I'd forego bites by fishing in the edges and just ignoring the main pack. Now, although this didn't catch me the bigger, and it did catch me a lot more of the bigger fish. And I think about my next seven or eight fish for over 30 pound, including a couple of 35s and one of the sort of main character fish in the lake known as Hartail, which was a 39 pound 14 ounces so just under 40 pound so I sort of figured out a way of getting amongst the bigger fish and it was by not over baiting you know just fishing for a bite in the edge was giving me the better size fish so again the next year I was just sort of dabbling uh, and I ended up getting a ticket come up that I'd waited a few years for which was on a lake I call the ski lake there's a really lovely old mirror in there. Again, probably a fish you can't afford to, um, you know, say I'll keep that ticket, it will still be there. Very old carp. And uh, last year I spent all summer fishing for that carp. And I actually ended up catching it, in, I think it was November time. And I fished a lake into December. And I thought, you know, I've had the big mirror. It's time to go back and have another go for white tips. I've now got probably two and a half years three years of knowledge on white tips, where it would get caught, what it would do. And one of its patterns were definitely, in the summer, it spent a lot of time living around, you know, a big bar that run the whole length of um, one of the banks of the lake. But during the winter, like most carp, they migrate out into silty areas and they spend a lot of time out in the center of the lake and not under the snags in the edges like they do in the summer. So I knew, that carp had been caught in the centre of the lake in two previous winters. So I just had to target the centre of the lake and hopefully I'll be in with a chance of that fish. So coming into December, I got down the lake and it was very busy. Like it's not uncommon to get down that lake and there'd be between 10 and 15 anglers on. It's a club lake. There's 3,000 members, but they're spread across, you know, 14 different lakes but quite often you'd get down there, it'd be a very busy lake. So during December, I decided rather than baiting up loads like I had in the previous times when I started fishing it, I was going down using 10, 15 kilo bait a session. During the winter, obviously, you don't want to be using them kind of quantities of bait, but the fact that people were still baiting quite heavy was making the fishing a lot more difficult than normal. So what I decided to do, was come up with a little solid bag mix that would offer me a super attractive way of fishing. So in that mix, I put crushed cell, crushed essential cell, which is yellow and a bit overpowering, some response pellet of different sizes and about 50 to 80 maggots. <laughs> so this was only a small bag. I wanted it to be one mouthful. So I knew that the center of the lake was seeing a lot more, you know, um, bait than it should. So when I was casting out there, probably 90% of the time I was fishing over other bait. And you only had to watch the bird life, the coots and the diving ducks. They were always coming up with bait. So there was no shortage of food for the carp. So I had to fish so attractive. So my first bite came, I think it was uh, in, it weren't December, it was January. because it was my first bite of the year. And that was on a solid bag cast out into the middle and it was a lovely 35 pound common. Really angry fish. Wouldn't even put his dorsal down for the photos. Absolutely beautiful carp. And I'd call it in a way that, you know, I thought I would catch a fish. 
on the solid bag, bait everywhere, the most attractive thing it could single out. So the next few weeks, I didn't catch anything. Uh, a couple of nights I was there, I was there almost on my own. It was nigh on freezing over, it was freezing cold. Then uh, we got a load of wet, and there was a few sessions where I was sat in four or five inches of water where the water level had come up so high. And you know, you start to question your sanity at that time of the year. I've now been fishing this lake on and off, you know, over three years. And uh, yeah, I blanked my last two nights, but still sticking to that method of them solid bags out in the silt area. So coming into the session where I caught the bigum, I got Dan and we was getting unusually warm temperatures for January. You know, you're seeing eight, 10 degrees, which you never normally get in January. I arrived at the lake and although I'd been fishing the woods bank, what they call the woods bank, I had nylon on my reels. In the past, I'd always fish braid on this venue because the lake itself has got a lot of zebra mussels and there's quite a lot of cutoffs on there. But I'd chosen to fish the fluora cast in 18 pound. Now fishing from what I call the field side bank, it meant that I didn't have to pull the fish over the sharp bar. So I was quite happy to use this, the 18 pound fluora cast. I've got down, there was a swim number, swim 11, that I'd done reasonably well out of a few winters before, and I decided I'd go in there. I set the bivvy up, everything was set up, got my gear around, and it just started to lightly rain. And I don't know why, as I walked past swim 10, which is probably about two or three rod lengths the other way, something, I don't know, it was sank in my gut, just said I need to be in there. Never fished this swim before. If anything, it fishes a very similar part of the lake, but it was just a gut feeling that I needed to be in there. So I put the bivy down, moved it along and set it back up. I got the rods out and I didn't mess around because there'd been a couple of fish out that morning and I knew I didn't want to be spotting and making a lot of noise because the fish were on the feed. So what I did, I cast a single a bag out, I left it about an hour, then I reeled it in on the clip, which was 16 and a half wraps, and I cast back out there on the clip, let it hit the bottom, and I repeated that process about five times in the next eight to 10 hours. And the reason being, a lot of my bites on there have come during the night or early morning. And now, so what I've got out in front of me is a big silt area that's quite tough silt, but there's a lot of natural food in it, and five or six of these small solid bags dotted around the area. So I knew that any carp coming in were finding these small attractive parcels full of crumb maggot and pellet. So the night was pretty uneventful. I got wiped out by a trailer. Someone had probably been cut off by a zebra on zebra mussels. I redid the rods at three o'clock in the morning. Both went out onto the clip. So it was about eight o'clock the next morning and I was quite tired from being woken up in the night by this trailer and the wind had turned and gone the other way down the lake. And I was thinking, do I need to do a move today? You know, will it push the fish down that end? And I decided to recast my right hand rod. So I've gone out, reeled in the right hand rod. And uh, this one, I didn't have a solid bag on. I changed it over, put a helicopter rig onto it with a big bunch of maggots on the back of a chop. I just fancied a change. I've waxed that one out and it's gone down with a fud and I'm just putting the rod down and the left hand rod that I'd put out at three o'clock in the morning on a solid bag, the bobbins just dropped down slowly. I've picked up the rod and bent into it and initially I didn't think it was a big fish. It just sort of held water and about halfway in, I started to, you know, think this fish feels heavier than what I originally thought it would. It's kited underneath my other line, which is still sinking at this moment. And obviously, as it comes into the margin, I've got nylon on. I'm starting to worry now about all the uh, zebra mussels. I'm wishing I'd stuck to the braid. But I kept the rod quite high, and the fish has come along in front of me. And suddenly, this common has hit the surface. And uh, I didn't right away know it was the big, and I just knew I had one of the big commons in the lake. As it's turned to go away, I've clocked that massive towel with the big white tips running through it and my legs turned to jelly. So three years later, they're now connected to that big long common and she has grown considerably. She's got bigger and bigger over these three years. She turned on the spot 
and she was definitely just about to bolt and I turned the net and in she went first time. And there she was, sat in the bottom of my net, absolutely nailed in her bottom lip. And the hook was a size six medium curve. I love them when you're doing open water fishing because even though they're a very fine wire hook, they're super sharp and they don't get away with a lot. I tied it really simple. It was literally knotless knot with a little bit of plastic with a small hook on the back of it that held 10 maggots. And uh, yeah, there was nothing complicated about that rig. The hook link was a bit of silk flex, about four and a half to five inches long. And that went nicely into the solid bag with an inline lead. So there was nothing complicated about the way I caught this carp. All I will say is that my hunch that she lived in the centre was completely correct. And um, I don't think I angled wrong for it in the last two years. Sometimes you're just looking for that one bite and uh, that day she was mine. <laughs>